This chapter is called coordination compounds. Coordination compounds are a whole bunch of different metal containing compounds. But what distinguishes them from uh, ionic compounds is that the interaction between the nonmetals is covalent and not ionic. And uh, that makes that very interesting. And, and so that's what this name implies here. It has a coordinate bond. And uh, so the book that I'm showing here is the sixth edition of Inorganic Chemistry. I haven't really talked about it, but you can actually go and look up the fifth edition for free. There's a PDF file available. All you have to do is Google Shriver and Atkins Inorganic Chemistry PDF, and you'll probably come up with the fifth edition. And I'll make references on the next slide which chapters you should be reading. It might be useful in addition to my lectures to do this. So uh, these new authors, Weller and Overton, they took over for the sixth edition. So let's take a look at a coordination compound. Like I said, if you have a hold of that book, you can uh, start reading chapter 20, 21, and 22. It covers pretty much what I'm about to, to uh, show you. So my first lecture is just a just an introductory lecture. It introduces the, uh, shows some compounds, different coordination numbers, how these bonds work, and uh, some of the discoveries too, which is very interesting. So, as I said, we have a covalent bond here between nonmetal and metal. If we detach this molecule from the metal, this is of course the ammonia compound, we call that when it does this type of interaction, we call it the amine ligand. So this is called amine with two M's to distinguish it from amines in organic chemistry. But so this is, uh, this has a lone pair of electrons. It's a loose space, as we know. And since cobalt has several empty D orbitals, and in fact, transition metals are ideal. They have Ds, Ps, and and uh, S orbitals for potential bonding and most of the time there are some empty ones and so they can take up, uh, they can act as Lewis acids and make bonds to, to these ligands. And so this, this can also be said for the chloride here. This then becomes a monoanionic chloro ligand. Anyway, here are three examples. The first two we have now looked at. We can have neutral electron donors and we can have monoanionic ones. The, the, the new one here is probably hydride. You might not have looked at hydrides, or if it was briefly mentioned, uh, maybe you didn't, uh, didn't cover it in any great detail, but you might have used calcium hydride as a reducing agent. And uh, so that's clearly a, uh, a hydrogen with an, an electron added, which makes it a hydride. We call it that in inorganic chemistry as well. Okay, so uh, it really isn't a big surprise that some of those metal to nonmetal interactions are covalent because it's uh, what makes something ionic is not the fact that you have a metal and a nonmetal, it's the difference in electronegativity between the two atoms, right? So if you have something like potassium, which has a very low electronegativity, and, and you uh, bind it with chlorine, you get a ionic bond. You have the potassium, very low electronegativity, transfer the electron to chloride. But if we, for example, uh, have elements like copper or silver or lead, and I'm circling these because my next slide has three examples that use those. They all coincidentally have an electronegativity of 1.9. So that's uh, much higher. And so if you uh, make a copper to chloride bond, or chlorine bond, the, the, the difference in electronegativity uh, is just not high enough to, for it to be ionic, so it's covalent. So there's a lot of covalent uh, compounds uh, that you can make or coordinate bonds between metals and nonmetals, and that's what coordination chemistry is. These three examples are simple. They're all complex ions, right? They all, once they form that donor bond, have a charge, so these are referred to as complex ions. The reason I have them here is because you might have seen them in the lab. They're part of some basic gen chem labs that, that are done standard-wise. Uh, so we know that silver chloride is considered, and by the way, we, we, we will still name these compounds um, in the ionic fashion, right? So, 
So even though uh, lead 2 hydroxide here gets the ionic naming scheme, that doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, that it is an ionic bond. But for naming purposes, we still name it that way. And coordination compounds have, uh, once they have ligands attached, they get a different naming scheme. And I have an entire lecture on how to name those, the nomenclatures, definitely important. But, but back to the silver chloride, and, and uh, just as a reminder, silver is always plus one, so we don't name it silver one chloride, this is just silver chloride and one of the exceptions when it comes to basic naming. So, uh, but, but silver, of course, is a transition metal. There are, uh, even though it's a late transition metal, there are still some orbitals. There's the P orbitals that are empty, and so you can put electron density in there. So two, two amine ligands can actually solubilize that. You know, silver chloride is insoluble. And so if you add uh, a concentrated ammonia to it, you get a coordination compound or a nitrogen to silver uh, coordinate bond, right? And then it actually knocks off the chloride and it becomes the counter ion. <clears throat> so let's go through the difference in electronegativity here. The bond I want to focus on is not the one between uh, chlorine and silver. It's the one, the new one that's made because that's clearly the Lewis base, Lewis acid interaction. So nitrogen has an electronegativity of 3.0. So the change in electronegativity in this case is 1.1. That would be considered a polar covalent bond. And um, so chlorine also has an electronegativity of 3.0, but, but uh, that gets knocked off. So that's clearly an ionic interaction. But uh, the amines are attached via a coordinate donor bond. And so this is just an example, right? Uh, the next one is lead hydroxide. And so we're adding an an additional hydroxide to that, so 1.9 oxygen has an electronegativity of um, 3.5. So here we are looking at a difference in electronegativity of 1.6. So it has a higher ionic character, but not um, not high enough for it to be ionic. So this is at best a polar covalent compound, and the best example is that between carbon. And, and, and copper, because copper has an electronegativity of 1.9, and carbon is 2.5. So that difference actually is, the difference in electronegativity is 0 0.6. So that's barely polar. It's almost nonpolar covalent. And, and so that's, those are clearly covalent bonds between these metals and nonmetals. So in general, a good way to look at these connections or compounds is a Lewis base, Lewis acid type interaction where the Lewis base is an electron donor. The fluoride here, I don't have the electrons shown, but you have electron density. You have a lone pair of electrons that can donate. In this case, we have, a, we have an sp2 hybridized boron. We usually say boron can have six electrons, but the reality is it will prefer eight, and if there's any kind of Lewis base present, it will bind to it. In fact, we already talked about uh, borane, which dimerizes to make uh, the two electron, uh, uh, three center two electron bonds. We talked about that earlier. We'll come back to that at some point. But uh, the point here is that we have an empty uh, p orbital, and if there, that's going to be a good Lewis acid, and Fluoride can then, or fluor, the fluorine here, can can donate that density, and you get BF4 again. That uh, uh, it's ionic, uh, and, and then of course that's just the base and the acid. You can look at the Lori Brunstad acid base um, interaction and, and and apply the Lewis acid Lewis base. You have uh, an electron donor, so anything, any element, whether it's neutral or or charged, that can donate electron density into an empty orbital whether it's a hybridized orbital or unhybridized, or it, uh, as long as one is available, and again, the D orbitals have a whole bunch. Now, uh, when they first discovered these compounds uh, back in the late 1800s, you know, they like Levoisier and these kinds of chemists, they, they had some very crude methods. They, they didn't have sophisticated instrumentation. They did some very best basic testing and then and then proposed, and uh, it's remarkable, right, what, what they actually came up with. But, for example, NMR, which is very helpful 
wasn't developed until 1945. So there's no NMR. So, so, so what, what people knew was they took cobalt-3 chloride and they used ammonia and they added it to, uh, together and they isolated uh, several different compounds that had different colors. And so they did some very basic, they could do mass spec, mass spec was actually in, invented in 1912. So, but not till 1912. So this was all proposed before that because Alfred Werner, who, who uh, made the correct proposal, won the Nobel Prize in 1913. And uh, but we did have X-ray, which is the the well again we did not have X-ray because the, the instrumentation wasn't developed until 1912 as well, because X-ray diffraction will ultimately uh, tell you the structure and conductivity of the crystalline solid, right? Not in solution necessary. That's when we use NMR. But the point is that uh, Blumstrat and Berzelius, they published a paper and they were guessing that nitrogen does the same thing as carbon. It just makes nitrogen nitrogen chains. And we know that's not true. And then uh, Alfred Werner came in and did some, he did some very basic testing. He didn't do NMR or any of these things. He just, he took these compounds and he, he did, a, did a couple of tests. One is a conductivity test. That's pretty simple, right? So if all of those nitrogens are connected and, uh, and uh, if the chlorines, are, are, are these chlorines here in this proposal, are they attached? Are they covalently bonded to the nitrogen or are they ions, right? So if this is truly the compound, there shouldn't be any uh, conductivity and so his, his control groups were sodium chloride, which of course had, breaks into sodium and chloride ions. So we have uh, a cation and an anion, and then calcium, which is plus two, and then we have two chlorides. So we have more ions, more charges, we have higher conductivity, and so we get like a standard. And so we can look at compound number four and say, well, this probably has two ions, same with this. So these two compounds, which are green and violet, have the same chemical composition, but they have different colors. So they must be some sort of isomers of each other. So that's a clue. And then, then here, and so, but then definitely you have a cation and an anion here. You don't have what Brazilius and, uh, proposed, so that doesn't work. Uh, and, and so we have very high conductivity here for the first one, so we probably have several uh, chloride anions and so what you do is you just test your solution with a source of silver like silver nitrate right because we do know that if any of these ions are chloride silver chloride is insoluble in aqueous solution so you would see silver chloride precipitate out and as long as you weigh uh, weigh your compound before and then you can isolate the silver chloride, you filter it and isolate, you can weigh, you can determine the ratio. And so here you can see that there are three free chloride ions. So you have three chloride counter ions. Here you have two chloride counter ions, right? And here at one, okay? And then just to make sure that these ammonia compounds, that these amines are actually attached somehow and, and not free, he added an acid to it, right? Because we do know that uh, an acid will react to form ammonium chloride. So he, he added HCl, right, in order to get ammonium chloride, right? So here you have, if you have any free NH3 and you add H plus to it, you get the ammonium ion, as you also know. And then if you have hydrochloric acid, you get, you can isolate that and so he found out that while well, this one actually doesn't have five amines, it only has four. So, so that's a really nice clue. And from that, he proposed the following uh, compounds here. He, he came up with uh, octahedral compounds that have different number of amine ligands. So again, we call these amines in inorganic chemistry, ammonia with two Ms. And so the green and violet compounds that have the same chemical composition ha are, are basically cis and trans isomers, right? So this one, if I recall, is green, and this one is violet or purple, right? But they, they so, so we have, can have cis and trans here too if these the ligands are across or together. 
and then uh, uh, here we have uh, the first one has all six spots occupied by an amine ligand and then it has those three counter ions with the highest electricity or conductivity. So that's just a very rudimentary, very basic test that Werner did and won the Nobel Prize for it. Uh, sounds simplistic, but it's quite remarkable for, for the times considering we didn't have all those instrumentations.